My start board there is a whole time to start from.
Hi, good evening, friends. My name is Rajesh Gupta. I work with Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, Hyderabad. All of us are going through a very difficult time, and it is a very, very difficult and uncertain time all over the world. However, as a part of continuing education, medical education program, today I'm going to talk about ERCP, its complications, and how to manage them. So over next 30 minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss all the complications of ERCP and how to manage them. As you know, those who are doing ERCP, this talk is primarily meant for my colleague, young colleagues or who are starting to do ERCP or those who are doing ERCP in a very small number of patients. So as Professor Peter Cotton, who is supposed to be one of the father figure in field of ERCP, he said very aptly that ERCP, 1% is frustration, 2% radiation, 3% inspiration, and 94% perspiration. Meaning thereby, the more you practice, the harder you practice, the better you become. So obviously, it's... Uh, all of us want to perform a safe ERCP. Safe ERCP means without complication. Though ERCP complication that can happen even in the expert's end, but to make it safer, we have to plan properly. We have to make plan includes several things. First and foremost thing is which patients you have going to take up for ERCP, you should know the correct indication. You should know what, uh, what are the comorbidities. You take a detailed history. You go through the charts. You go through the imaging, whatever you have. And then you plan whether you want to do a concise sedation or the patients that require any other special stints from your anesthesiology colleague. And then accordingly, you prepare. You prepare the accessory. You prepare the guide. What are the accessories you are likely to require? And of course, you require monitoring during the procedure and after the procedures. So all these precautions you need to take when you plan to do ERCP so as to avoid complications. So this is a very seminal paper, landmark paper, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1996. It discussed the complication of endoscopic biliary sphincterotomy and this paper acts as a framework for future studies and all the complication which has happened in ERC, during ERCP. They have discussed very elegantly and that's the region. And during this paper, we came across the most common complication which are likely to happen during this procedure. So what are the most common complication which are likely to happen? The more foremost is pancreatitis. This is the most dreaded and most common complication which we can encounter during ERCP. The second important complication is during ERCP, we perform sphincterotomy. So what can happen? It can cause hemorrhage, it can cause perforation. And another important complication which can sometimes be life-threatening is cholangitis. If you have doing ERCP in obstructed biliary system and you are not able to drain it properly, you can cause severe cholangitis. So these are the four most common complications which we can come across during the procedure. Of course, rarely we can have cholecystitis, we can have stent-related complication. And in addition to that, some patients, they can develop cardiopulmonary complication like sudden uh, respiratory distress or respiratory arrest or some cardiac event which can happen. Though before look, going to the chart or if you are doing uh, with the help of your ERCP consultant uh, or you are doing with the anesthesiologist is there in the theater, sometimes they are not there. In that situation, it is very, very pertinent. You have a trained anesthesiology nurse with you to monitor the patient continuously. And of course, sometimes other rare complication can also happen during the course of ERCP. So let us start. So 
what are the complication which are the things which can lead to pancreatitis so this is the first and foremost thing which can happen first thing is you have to identify what are the risk factors what are the risk factors which can lead to post ercp pancreatitis which has already been worked out in various studies and which have been found out in earlier data which has been published over a period of time so first and foremost things is the patient related complication which are the which we already know through the charts of the patients if you go carefully through the charts you can find out whether the patient has any definite risk factors so that you can be extra cautious or you can take precautions so what are those factors patient related factors that is patients who have younger age group those who have sphincterophodi dysfunction the patients have risk of post ercp pancreatitis in the past they are the most likely candidate who can develop the other th important thing is technique related techniques i mean the patients the if the endoscopist has a low working in a low volume centers so their risk of complications goes up if you are repeatedly doing pancreatic ductal injections the risk of pancreatitis goes up if you are planning to do pre cut or you are doing pancreatic sphincterotomy then their risk of pancreatitis goes up and in addition to that if you are doing balloon dilation of the biliary sphincter in especially in younger group the risk is higher these are the risk factor which are already known sometimes there may be some patient related factor which has been found out what are this female sex they are more likely to develop complications as sinarization absence of cbd stone means there is a intermediate risk and these days we do us evaluation sometimes the patient may show some biliary where if the ultrasound abdominal ultrasound didn't show anything or the duct is normal the risk is slightly higher other patient with the patients those who have no patient related but the duct is small means what we call that high risk of pancreatitis they are likely to develop so these are the things which you can know beforehand that these are the patients who are likely to develop post ercp pancreatitis so you have to be mindful of these factors before going ahead with the ercp as you see in this chart if you have multiple factors the risk of pancreatitis post ercp pancreatitis goes exponentially if the patients are lower the risk factors the lower the number of risk factors the lesser the frequency of pancreatitis as the number of risk factors goes up the risk of pancreatitis goes up this is what exactly it shows so mind if the patient say for example is a female the bilirubin is normal the suspicion of sphincterophodi dysfunction the biliary cannulation difficult so the risk will obviously go up obviously if you are doing a therapeutic ercp the risk is more than diagnostic these days this is an old slide which i would like to say because these days we don't do diagnostic ercp anymore except in very rare circumstances otherwise all the ercp these days whatever we perform they are performed with the intent of therapeutics so what are the precautions we can take what are the things which we can do to prevent post ercp There are several things. First and foremost thing is pharmacologic agents which we can use for the procedures to so as to prevent the post ERCP pancreatitis. Other strategies you can use pancreatic agents to prevent the post ERCP pancreatitis. These are the two strategies which has already been well well published. And I'm going to discuss shortly. And there are several techniques which are very very useful in case of difficult biliary cannulation. Let us come to the drugs which have been shown to, which have been used uh, in, in to prevent pre, uh, post biliary uh, post ERCP pancreatitis. There are a number of drugs which have been tried and tested in several patients. The majority of them, unfortunately, found to be very very effective. So, mean by the large number of drugs which have been tested, very few as to and a few drugs which have been found to effect and most effective among them is ancelet so there are several studies and large number of them are randomized control studies 
the results are inconsistent because some studies are underpowered and some studies were no useful so let us come to the most important things which we do to prevent post trcp pancreatitis that is use of insects so this was the elegant study was published in gastroenterology in the year 2003 it was clearly shown that diclofenac reduces the incidence of acute pancreatitis after trcp so the advantage of this drug is the insects these are commonly available they are very cheap and the mechanism is known uh, it are caused to uh, inflammatory inhibit the inflammatory cascade which trcp is likely to do the meta analysis also has been done this has been found very clearly there is a clear cut advantage if you use ethyl endomethacin uh, or uh, uh, diclofenac and they have shown clear advantage for the placebo so it significantly reduces the risk of post trcp as this analysis which was published in 2008 in gut clearly shown another uh, this is paper which was published in new england journal in 2012 has also shown that endomethacin shows clearly the post trcp this is in the revised this is also rct and it shows clearly that is a significant uh, risk of a reduction if you use total endomethacin so this has been found to be very very safe and effective and this is uh, you can see in the chart very clearly the risk is a clear risk reduction if you see the if placebo risk of all post trcp pancreatitis 16% whereas we use endomethacin it is 9.2% more severe also was less we were using this uh, study another important thing is that this event for not uh, the concern was always endomethacin or the uh, and Uh, this cancer so it causes it to gi bleed or renal failure which was not found in this study so there is a clear cut based on this data it's clearly recommended as a grade one recommendation if you use rectal seen or diclofenac it is very useful for preventing post trcp pancreatitis it is a grade one recommendation so now if we look at other agents that have also been tried and one of them is topical epinephrine because it is known for sphincter sphincterocardial relaxation there are contradictory results sometimes we have used it in lactic pd stent also this was a study which was conducted uh, it's a multi center study our center was one of the part of this study and we have found that topical epinephrine along with the rectal endomethacin to prevent post trcp high risk group of patients so in this study this was a negative study and it didn't show any significant difference however in recently this study when we do secondary analysis we found that if we use fluid this finger lactate solution along with this p uh, epinephrine it shows definitely advantages and what we found that the very procedural if we inject finger lactate along with the endomethacin it does reduce incidence of post trcp pancreatitis now coming to the second modality to prevent post trcp pancreatitis that is prophylactic pancreatic stent it's been clearly shown though it is long back those who are high risk for pancreatitis those who are high risk for pancreatitis if we put a uh, place a uh, prophylactic pd stent the risk of post trcp pancreatitis significantly comes down this was published long back in gastroenterology 19 And this is the analysis which was published 
which has shown very clearly there is a clear cut advantage of pancreatic stent is versus no pancreatic stent uh, in prevention of post ERCP pancreatic. Problem with pancreatic stents are sometimes it may be unsuccessful. It obviously, are sometimes stent-related complications. And it obviously, add to the cost and is inconvenient. And sometimes it doesn't fall off on its own. So then you have to do a second procedure to remove the stent. So taking into consideration whether we can eliminate the need of pancreatic stent at all and we can just use rectal handsets either endomethacine or diclofenac. So this study uh, was performed and published in American Journal of Gastroenterology. So they found that if you do just rectal endomethacine, the risk of post-ERCP pancreatitis was less the combination endomethacine plus PDC. So it led to a, an idea whether, yes, whether we have to check whether we can do endomethacine alone is sufficient to prevent post, uh, post ERCP pancreatitis so that you need not put any pancreatic step. So now coming to other technique that is procedure, other, uh, that is another important trial which is still underway that is called SVI trial. SVI trial is something which has been very, very important and it is going on for last many years. It was started in 2015. It's a non-inferiority trial. So in SVI trial, the stent versus indomethacin. This trial is multicentric trial. It means nine U.S. academic centers are involved. It has been in March 2020, and any time these results should be out because this is a very important trial which will tell us clearly whether rectal indomethacin is known enough, or in that case, we will be uh, will not any more require pancreatic stent. Then. Coming to the post-procedural technique, we can, if suppose, uh, because it is has been very, very clearly shown, the technique related, uh, it's a post-ERCP pancreatitis itself has, it's a technique-driven procedure, so it requires a lot of technical skills. So if it is technically demanding, so obviously the procedure has to, certain procedural or technical issues we can, uh, we can use. Uh, during the pro difficult cannulation. So the first and foremost thing is guide-wired cannulation. It has been shown that it is superior if you are using cannuli or if you are finding it difficult. So no, uh, these days it is the one of the most common procedure to use a straight, straight away we use uh, guide, wire guided cannulation instead of drop cannula. The other important thing is suppose if you are not able to desire that cannulation or the biliary cannulation you can use double wire technique or you can do this papillotomy or you can do trans pancreatomy so that you can uh, avoid the risk of pancreatitis. So these are the procedures you can adopt, you can learn to avoid post ERCP pancreatitis. Another simple strategy is to avoid post ERCP pancreatitis aggressive fluid management. So we don't know when you start doing ERCP, when the pancreatitis is going to happen or which group. Generally, uh, the time frame is not very, very clear. So there is a short golden window that we can take before when you finish the procedure and initial few hours. If you administer ringer lactic solution, so risk of pancreatitis will go down. So this is what exactly has been shown. And they've shown that if in high risk patient, if you give ringer lactate solution, in first two hours, uh, hour you give two liters of ringer lactate and followed by two to three liters in next 12 hours. So the risk of pancreatitis has been shown to be reduced. So, but you have to be mindful of the fact because aggressive fluid management can have its own challenges, can lead to complications. So you have to be careful with that. So 
now moving on to the next complication that is bleeding so it, all of us who are doing ercp are very well aware that ercp when if you do sinterotomy it can cause bleeding fortunately severe bleeding it can happen minor bleed can happen in around one third of patients but significant bleeding is only 2% of patients fortunately the mortality is mortality is further low down so it can happen but you should know how to control the bleeding so that in the next few slides i'm going to discuss how to control the post intraoperative bleeding mm -hmm. the first thing as i said we should be mindful which are the patients likely to develop post intraoperative bleeding so that you have to be careful how you avoid intraoperative in these patients to prevent post intraoperative bleeding the definite risk factors are again they have been published long back the those who have coagulopathy those who have anticoagulant drugs severe cholangitis or ercp obviously low volume center this is more in the sense because technically demanding procedure cirrhosis is another condition the risk of bleeding is related uh, periamblement diverticulum or if you using paper there is slightly more sometimes resume that is uh, some ampullary tumor if you do think what we they can lead to but other consensus it has not been found to be a very important factor as far as post intraoperative bleeding is concerned uh, just is a video i'm just trying to open so the first thing is when we see in the big post panic see the bleeding where it is happening no there is a one more so this is the previous video which basically this is another uh, Uh, video which i am trying to show it is basically the utility of spray coagulation in preventing the post sphincterotomy as you can see we are trying to do a pre cut sphincterotomy and when you see this kind of ooze so what you can do is you can use the same needle knife for spray coagulation and what we are doing is spray coagulation to prevent the bleed so once you do spray coagulation as you can see the bleeding stops but more important thing is we should not panic what is important technique is once we see the bleeding then you have to identify the bleeding spot and then you can apply the clips these are the endoscopic clips what we use for bleeding some time you will also bleed also so these clips are very very helpful in preventing the bleed as you can see it's little challenging because to manage in the side wing scope placement of uh, hemoglobin is a little challenging so the same thing i'm trying to show it again then you can see it you see the bleeding has stopped so this is an algorithmic approach if you see a post sphincterotomy bleed don't panic if you have seen the blood oozing from the site of sphincterotomy first complete the cut because the vessel if you leave it incomplete it may not retract and it will continue to bleed so first extend the cut if you see that extending the cut or complete swing after even after complete sphincterotomy the bleeding is not stopped they to use the technique what we call spray coagulation which i just showed you why the go if it is still bleeding is not controlled then you can inject epinephrine that still it doesn't work then you can use balloon tamponade that is what these balloon this we commonly use for stretch uh, stone extraction balloon we are available in all our endoscopy units you can tamponade with the help of these inflated balloon 
and if even after that if it is not controlled then we try with injection like saline adrenal injections coagulation again if it works fine otherwise you can try hemoclips or you can use sometimes what we call covered biliary stents they can cause stoppage of the bleed if you feel that bleeding is too torrential and is still not controlled you can get help of your interventional radiology colleague or if it is not available you can see the help of your surgical colleagues but this is a very rare situation these days this technique majority of the patients you can do and you can control the post symptomatic in endoscopy theater itself so the another important thing is uh the direction of the cut is very very important as you know you should be mindful when you do endoscopy a uh, biliary sphincterotomy you should be aware that which direction you are cutting so there is a relative avascular area well of clock whether you are good uh, doing sphincterotomy uh, from above downward sometime it happens that uh, up, when you are doing pre cut we use about we can use either below upwards or up or down uh, upward down approach so you start from avascular area and which is generally at 12 o'clock and it is uh, there uh, the risk of bleeding is more but uh, less uh, but sometimes there could be some aberrant vessels which can cause the bleeding so if you find that bleeding is there then you can use those abo mentioned technique that just i show so now coming to the other important uh, this is the uh, uh, just um, can you help me the uh, aya there is aya just see the video anyway so what i am sure trying to i will show is This is the direction which I am cutting. I will go right up here. You know, we clearly see that we we cut with eleven and twelve o'clock position. At twelve o'clock, this is the relatively avascular area. So I am sorry, this video is not working. Anyway, we move on. So the next important thing is about the perforations. These perforations can happen even in the expert hand. So, you, but you should be mindful if the you and you should be careful. to prevent perforation during the procedures this perforation can be because of the guide wire or it could be because of string cord but this perforation can be endoscopically done whereas the free perforation if it happens it happens during if there is a surgically altered anatomy or if sometimes if there is a narrowing and if you manipulate the endoscope the bleeding uh, this can cause big perforations स्ट्रक्चरिंगली And as you can see in this video, you saw there was abnormal structures appearing during ERCP, and then it means something is wrong. And then we did ER. If you do a CT scan, you can immediately find a lot of air in and around. There is a peridina layer. There is a peridina layer. So this patient immediately should be given a surgery. Fortunately, if there is a smile perforation because of guide wire or because of sinkrotomy. So slowly, slowly it will resolve. As you can see, the day one, if you see the X-ray, there is a period in uh, air. Then slowly, slowly start resolving, and by day seven, there is hardly any air. So it means nothing to worry. Don't panic. But identify it early. Another important, com serious complication which can happen that can happen in obstructed urinary tract, and this is a especially true. in case of severe obstruction biliary obstruction happening due to malignant causes like carcinoma hepatocarditis or cholangiocarcinoma anatomy is altered because of duodenum is fixed and deformed 
and sometimes there is a very tight structure and persistent which is the complex so always be careful when there is a obstructive system don't inject until unless you are sure you are deep inside the detailed system so this situation you should not allow to happen when you are not deep in by the BRT, you should not inject. Obviously, success and complication are directly proportional as to the volume of the center where you are performing ERCP. As you can see very clearly, number of cases, the center are less than 200, the risk of complication and success are directly uh, bored out. If you the number of Procedures are more if you are doing, say, for example, more than 200 procedures a year, the risk of complication is low and the failed cannulation also rate or failure of ERCP also goes down. So, as I said earlier, the more practice you do or the more volume you do, the risk of complication go down, the chances of success goes up. So the very, very important, so this is a very important slide to prevent the complication. Always keep in mind the indications of ERCP when you are planning ERCP. So the risk of complication will go up significantly if you are doing ERCP for weak indication. So always go through the chart, go through the indication before doing ERCP because the, if the weak indication is there, especially like weight abdominal pain, or the patient has isolated or tentative mild dilation, if there is a mild increase in amylase and lipase, there is a suspicion of sphincterophoronite dysfunction. And as a mark of suppose if you find there is a intrahepatic cholestasis and mild dilation, if there is clear cut evidence of BP obstruction, try to do non ERCP evaluate the mind like MRCP or US before directly going to ERCP. So this is a very, very important uh, uh, message you should keep in mind to prevent post-ERCP complication. So as the Professor Cotton has long back wet rightly said that ERCP is most dangerous for people who least require it. So we should always keep in mind this important message which Professor Cotton has given long back. But complications are unavoidable and they are bound to happen even in the expert and because why this complication happen, this is a very important statement which is made. The gap that we know and what we aim for is always there and the gap complicates everything we do. So the aspiration is to go and perform the procedure perfectly, but it is not a perfect work. There is always a, a gap what we know or what we can aspire to do, but sometimes it is not is all the time. As we said, so it is another very uh, famous uh, endoscopist and uh, Professor Costa Mania from US, uh, Italy. He says, if you don't want any complication, you become a pathologist. So to prevent complication, we always prepare a checklist and this helps a long way to prevent the complication. Thank you very much and I am willing to take on any question if you have any doubt. Thank you very much. Stay at home, stay healthy, stay safe.
So there are a couple of questions. The first question is from Mishra. So he says, uh, the question is, in case of post-ERCP, if plastic scent is in false track, it's diagnosed on imaging, what we should do? And what step you should not be missed to avoid this layer complication? Yes, Dr. Mishra, it can sometimes happen if you deploy a plastic stent, the wrong prep. But while deploying the plastic stent, it is always very, very important. They do under fluoro uh, guidance and their, your wire should always be in the desired duct. So if you and sometimes your assistant can, uh, you know, uh, withdraw the wire early. So it happens in only that time because otherwise you will not be able to deploy if you already in the wrong track on the false track, you will not be able to deploy the uh, plastic stent in the wrong duct or uh, out, uh, outside the biliary tree. So the question is what to do? You have to remove the plastic stent obviously and you, then you try to cannulate in the right duct and uh, if possible then and there itself or otherwise uh, if the duct system is obstructed then you can take help of your uh, uh, colleague in the re interventional radiology if you are not able to get into the design or into the biliary tree. So the second question is uh, uh, is how mandatory is to do balloon sweep each and every time when we relieve a bile duct stent? Yes it is it is helpful, not necessary, but it is always helpful because sometimes when uh, generally uh, post cholecystectomy, some of the stone, because uh, we do ERCP for uh, CBD stone, which we have been detected before cholecystectomy and you leave a stent, other surgeon asks the, us to leave a stent because the duct is dilated and uh, while doing cholecystectomy, one of the stone might have slipped into the bile duct and if you remove blindly, without doing a balloon sweep, uh, biliary balloon sweep, maybe this, it may end up with cholangitis. So it is better to do a balloon sweep when you remove bile duct stand. It is always helpful. Full of, uh, this is a, statin, it has not been found to be very, very useful, but then, uh, these uh, handsets and pediatric stand, these uh, drugs are not being found to be very useful in PET. No other drug has been found to be very effective, except rectal endomethacine or rectal diclofenac and pediatric stand. So, while the another question is uh, from Dr. Ankit Patel, by performing ERCP, when to do dicholangiogram and where cholangiogram? That's a very important question these days. So to prevent cholangitis, generally when we are dealing with higher strictures, or biliary strictures, especially tight stricture, it is better to do air cholangiogram rather than uh, di -col contrast cholangiogram because sometimes you opacify the ducts on both sides and uh, you may uh, not be able to drain. So the risk of cholangitis will go down and if you do um, use air cholangiogram vis a vis So, the, another important question is uh, from Dr. Lohit. Last rectal and answer should be given in the endosuit only, or how early it should be given? It should be given pre procedure, ideally, in the endoscopic suit itself. So, you can use 100 milligram uh, lab or uh, in the endoscopy suit itself before you start the procedure. A post, another question is post ERCP perforation management, endoscopy versus surgical management, when and how to decide. So as I said earlier, during the course of discussion of perforation, so if you feel that perforation is guide wire induced or syntrotomy induced, that's a minor perforation and you can very well tackle it endoscopically. So there is no need to panic, but you should be very, very clear. The plan, you should uh, manage it uh, very consentiously and you should not leave the patient unattended because sometimes you have to keep a close watch. And as far as the surgery is concerned, 
you feel that's a perforation it's a scope guided perforation especially in altered biliary anatomy then it will be very difficult to manage it endoscopically but if you can detect early and if any if it is a scope perforation these days you can use if you have expertise available in your center or you can yourself use you can use uh, uh, these ovesco clips which can or you can uh, do the apollo stitch also if you detect because these are healthy tissue and if you are able to repair you can get away with the scope induced perforation endoscopically but suppose if you are not able to handle it it is better to go for surgery especially if it is a scope induced perforation it is better to inform your surgical team even if you are managing it endoscopy so what is the appropriate time after endoscopy to remove prophylactic and at extent to perforate you can remove it as after to 3 weeks but the thing is if you are using it as a thin stent especially three friend stent there is some majority of the time it follow but in our country we have only five friend stent so we have to remove majority of the time so generally we remove it when we call if uh, we have used plast uh, beat cbd stent also uh, as a uh, for cholecystic cholecyst after cholecystectomy when you remove you can remove both at the same time otherwise you, you remove these stents after two weeks so the same question again indication of surgery in case of post trcp perforation i feel already i have discussed again if it is a guide wire induced perforation or symphotomy induced perforation you can very well manage it endoscopically but if it is scope induced perforation it depends whether you can uh, close it then in there itself otherwise in form the surgical in ampullary carcinoma is sphincterotomy safe well uh, the, in ampullary carcinoma the sphincterotomy can induce bleeding and sometime it can be severe so it is better not to do uh, sphincterotomy sometimes the challenge is if it is a ampullary orifice tumor which is kind but causing uh, uh, bulging of the ampulla above the orifice then you can sometime you do infundibular otomy to cannulate because sometimes it is difficult to cannulate then but large sphincterotomy obviously is avoided in this situation we can so Then another question is related to how to control bleeding after sphincterotomy, not controlled by local measures. Yes, I have already uh, discussed while discussing the management of post sphincterotomy bleeding. So first thing and first is to complete the cut when you start seeing the bleeding. If you feel that it is not stop, you can do injection therapy, adrenaline. saline adrenal injection so if still doesn't stop you can use spray coagulation if doesn't work then the choice is you can use hemoclip which if it is available it is little challenging if doesn't work if it is little expensive procedure you can use fully covered biliary scms it can cause tamponade and can cause the bleeding so why not oral ansets so the this the This is a very interesting question. Why not oral answer to prevent pancreatitis? Data is not there. That's the reason we are not using. But we can try. But still, we don't have data to support that whether it be used oral. And because the other important thing is sometimes you know when we do ERCP and sedation and all, so that could be the risk probably to the patient will require water sometimes. Because vomiting and anesthesia may be a challenge in this. it is primarily with the rectal and the question is when to remove pancreatic stent if guide wire get inside pd any video aids available to learn rcp yes there are a lot of video aids are available there are asg videos are also there there you can visit our aig website also you can see uh, during the workshop also lot of uh, videos are available and you can learn rcp and you can visualize as uh, you see all the videos of different techniques they are available in plant now coming to the us versus ercp difference in complication with respect to bleeding pancreatitis and perforation well us is a very safe procedure as far as uh, 
complication of ERCP is obviously much more. That's why it's supposed to be safer than ERCP. Risk of perforation is there and there is an obstruction of the duodenum and the anatom is deformed. Otherwise, the risk of perforation is not uh, very, very minimal. The bleeding and pancreatitis is not there. The risk of bleeding, risk of pancreatitis is not there in US, where it is there always in the RCP. Obviously, we prefer for whenever we are in doubt, where there is an intermediate possibility of mild stone, or if the diagnosis is not clear on imaging, whatever we have, we always prefer the US before taking up the patient for ERC. So they are complementary, they are not competitive. These days, uh, obviously, uh, this is the era when EUS is competing with ERCP, especially in far as far as the therapeutics are concerned. But still, we are not reached the stage. ERCP is still the mainstay for biliary uh, endotherapy. Over a period of time, maybe down the line, ERCP may a US guided biliary intervention will take precedence of ERCP, but the time is yet to come. But yes, in certain situations, they are equally and as efficacious as ERCP. A role of somatostatin again, there is a no clear cut hard evidence to say that it prevents post ERCP pancreatitis. I will again reiterate that so far rectal handsets and extent are the mainstay to prevent post-DRCP pancreatitis. So in a patient, the next question is again, in a patient with suspected PEP, the appropriate time window to order lipase and lipase, exceeding the chance of elevation should be used at one or three times. So it is uh, generally uh, because uh, this is important, but this is for the protocol if you are following the, like if you are doing a study, generally it should be taken after six hours and uh, within six hours to, to 20 hours generally we consider. And because in sometimes when there's uh, risk of pancreatitis, what we assess, uh, if uh, we do early, the risk of pancreatitis obviously will be slightly higher. And if you do after 24 hours, the, it may not be there. And uh, if the patient has pain immediately post-procedure and you do amylase and lipase, then obviously it's a case of pancreatitis. So I would recommend, there is a guidance, there are guidance in the sense uh, protocols if you are following this in especially in high-risk pancreatitis six hours how soon should we start orally take if the patient is comfortable there is no pain and the patient has passed flat us right within six hours in six hours you can give oral sips and you can start feeding and uh, you can get clear sips of water and if the patient is completely comfortable uh, after 12, 10 to 12 hours you can start feeding What to do when you have a proximally migrated pancreatic stent and presenting with recurrent pancreatitis? It's very challenging, especially this problem is uh, a problem uh, when you are having a uh, using PD stent as a prophylaxis and when the duct, pancreatic duct is normal. So it is always very, very challenging to remove the pancreatic stent, but you can do it. If the you can pass a guide wire alongside the pancreatic uh, in the pan deep into the pancreatic duct beyond the stent, and then you try to uh, retrieve the uh, stent either with the basket, uh, my uh, mini basket, but the risk obviously will be there because the duct is very uh, thin and very small. Or you what you can do is you can half inflated balloon. You can try to drag the uh, stand alongside, but if you are not successful, you leave another stand, longer stand, and then give some time. By that time, the duct become little more dilated, and after four weeks, you can go again instead of repeatedly cannulating and repeatedly uh, doing uh, ERCP to try to retrieve the stand and there itself. But you can definitely re uh, remove the migrated PD stand, but it is, I agree, it's challenging. 
the next question is so how to remove a biliary stent which is stuck inside and breaks biliary stents are easy as compared to pancreatic ductal stent but uh, you have to go above as i said above the stent with uh, where it is lost and then try to retrieve either with a balloon or a basket if you can if suppose if a fragment is uh, big enough and you can cannulate you can railroad a sohindra uh, screw inside the stent itself and you can screw it out that is another good way especially in bile duct stent where the stent is long uh, place uh, uh, you can cannulate the stent itself with the wire and then you can uh, railroad uh, the device inside the stent and can easily retrieve but if it is not do if you are not able to do that you can go above the stent and try to remove it with the help of balloon or with the help of basket so regarding the paper which talked about examination of tenderness and amylase 4 hour early refeeding can be done yes you can do early refeeding if uh, the patient but the if the problem here is if the patient starts vomiting then it as the moment the patient is not vomiting and the pain uh, is not worsening you can start early refeeding but especially you should be careful and cautious risk of coming risk of bleeding in amputated tumor and how to control it endoscopy this is ir guided amputation it's another important question as i said if you cut a ampullary tumor the risk of bleeding is always there but you can do it if it is a minor bleed and you can uh, use local therapy then there itself like you can do apc or you can do some injection therapy but if you feel that it is not controlled then there itself because sometimes it's majority uh, it is, uh, you can very well appreciate that it is arterial bleed then you should ask your interventional guy to do embolization because it may cause torrential bleeding and it can even cause bleeding. So now another question is regarding when to choose spontaneous biliary drainage over ERCP with respect to indication and complication. Spontaneous ERCP multiple plastic versus uh, metal stents. So first question, when to choose spontaneous biliary drainage? So the indications are very very clear. If the patients had uh, cholangitis and you are not uh, and with obstructed biliary system, and you are not able to complete the ERCP, you should always ask either your interventional radiologist to do PTBD or yourself, or if you are comfortable. These days we have another choice of US guided biliary drainage. If ERCP is difficult because of anatomical reasons like obstruction. Uh, deformed uh, papilla or because of uh, difficulty in uh, staying the position or you can in that situation if you can uh, use us guided biliary intervention as well but if it is not available which is i can understand is not available in all the centers in that case you should immediately summon your uh, you should immediately do ptbd if you ERCP has failed and you have injected contrast with the biliary tree. If you have not injected contrast in the biliary tree, then you can wait and uh, go till the next day if the patient is not any emergency or if there is no cholangitis. As far as the post ERCP bleeding, again, multiple plastic stent versus SCMS. Plastic stents have been tried, but uh, it requires a lot of plastic stent makers. Uh, if the plastic stents you place, uh, the bleeding, uh, if uh, the duct is very dilated, they may not stay and uh, it may not uh, control the bleeding adequately because the tamponade may not be adequate. In that situation, it is better to use fully covered uh, metal stent rather than multiple plastic stents because the tamponade will not be there. So, if uh, at all, if you use uh, to control bleeding, you should use pref preferably fully covered metal stent rather than multiple plastic stent. Uh, I again, uh, so if pancreatic stent migrates toward the tail options for removal, yes, you can use pancreatoscopy also, or you can, as I said, you 
try to if it's not deep inside the tail or not embedded in the tail you can try to go with the uh, wire and try to drag it down with the help of a balloon uh, partially inflated balloon so that it will sometime it helps but it's a matter of uh, but obviously if we are not able to remove it then you can use help scopy also that's a very good option if it is available but the, obviously it can be costly and the another challenge to using pancreatoscopy is if the duct is not dilated it is going to be very very difficult especially if it is toward the tail because the duct is of very thin and it will not be very, very easy to do pancreatoscopy if it's next question is from dr devesh again uh, if it is a cirrhotic patient has large varices along with cholangitis it should be handled first crcp cholangitis even obviously you should go for crcp first and uh, if there is a cholangitis you should uh, use uh, you can selectively uh, cannulate the bile duct and you do uh, leave as bile duct drainage stone uh, and leave the obstruction first and then take this patient for evl so obviously you do evl for varices later on first you get the cholangitis with ercp followed by uh, evl for varices okay thank you very much i think uh, if there are no more questions thank you gentlemen for participating in this webinar i am very very thankful to all of you who have participated in this webinar and again thank you very much stay home stay safe and keep watching the cme program at aig from aig hospital thank you very much once again